So welcome back to another day. And the topic for today is uh, indeterminate forms. That's section 2.5 in your book. Uh, if you want, if, if you've read ahead or if you want to read along as we're discussing. Uh, I hope you saw my note on Google Classroom. Uh, this class will go better if, you, if you've watched my, my video on indeterminate forms, uh, just a 12 minute video. Uh, but it, I'm gonna proceed with the lesson assuming that you have watched that so that we can get to more examples and maybe more uh, chapter exercises to help prepare you for homework. Uh, but definitely check that out if you didn't get a chance to see it. And if you didn't get a chance to see it, you might be helped by uh, having your textbook nearby to reference or uh, like having like an electronic copy of it up during class. So I won't spend a lot of time on definitions, but I'll, I'll definitely try to uh, answer any questions or, or catch you up on anything. If, if you like. So just let me know in the chat or, or yell out. But we'll still do at least a, like a little bit of an explainer. So let's try to work off the document camera today. Just like me, sometimes this camera takes a, a little bit of time to get focused. Okay, so uh, what are these indeterminate forms? They arise in a special situation when you are, they arise in a special situation when you're trying to calculate the, the limit as X goes to a, a number say x goes to a of a quotient or a ratio of, of two functions. And so for some examples, you're going to be able to determine the value of the limit without doing much work, basically just by plugging in the, the value of the number. So for instance, if f of x over g of x uh, is a continuous function, so if f and g were continuous and g of a was not equal to zero, then the answer you could just get by plugging in, you could get f of a over g of a, and that would be the answer. So this is if f of x over g of x is continuous. See me using CTS for continuous. But other things could happen. So it could be true that f of x over g of x is not continuous. And most often the way that happens is when f over g is not defined at the point a. So for instance, say we wanted to calculate the limit Let's take a equals three. So limit as x goes to three. And let's take f of x to be x squared minus four x plus three. And let's take g of x to be x squared plus x minus 12. So x squared plus x minus 12. And so if this is continuous, then you're going to be able to get the answer just by plugging in the number three. So go ahead and try that. I'll give you 10 or 15 seconds. So plug in that number three to see what you get as your answer.
So after giving you some time to work, you, you may have realized that when you plug in 3 to the numerator to x squared minus 4x plus 3, uh, you get 0. When you plug it into the denominator, x squared plus x minus 12, you get what, 9 plus 3 minus 12, you also get 0. So if you try to, to use a substitution method or to plug in, you'll end up with an expression of the form 0 over 0. And of course, such expressions are, are mathematically meaningless. We can't take that expression and determine anything about the limit, whether it does or does not exist, and if it does exist, what the limit is. And when we're studying calculus, we've given such, uh, such meaningless expressions a special name. So this is an example of an indeterminate form meaning that you cannot determine whether or not the limit exists or its value just from the form that you get when you plug in x equals 3. So you have to do something else in order to uh, calculate the value of the limit. Other ratios can be indeterminate forms. So if you got like this was 0 over 0, but it could also be like infinity over infinity, meaning that that would be the case if the numerator had uh, uh, infinite discontinuity and the denominator also had an infinite discontinuity. We saw examples of functions like that last time. We'll do examples today. Uh, another example of an indeterminate form, like infinity times 0, or something like infinity minus infinity. So these are all just meaningless expressions that you get in, that, that you get when you try to incorrectly apply the limit laws. Uh, that is to say, just substituting in the value. Uh, and then instead of getting a number as an output, you get uh, one of these indeterminate forms. It's not always going to be the case that you can then go on to calculate the limit if you get an indeterminate form but sometimes you can. And I'll show you a lot of examples where you actually can calculate the limit. And this is one of them. So let's return to our original question that we take the limit of x squared minus or x plus three divided by x squared plus x minus 12. And we know this gives us an indeterminate form. We know that we can't simply plug in the value 3 in order to get the limit. Remember that limit means we're asking ourselves the question, what do these numbers, so what is this y value, what does this ratio approach as x approaches 3? And to do that, we need to present this ratio in a way that is a little more clear. In order to do that, you're going to have to remember how to factor. I don't know that I was an expert at factoring when I took calculus for the first time, but I'm also teaching in the academy this semester, so I've, I've just been talking about factoring. So hopefully I'll be able to do it. Actually, I'll give you um, maybe 30 seconds to try to factor this yourself before I show the answer. But, but I'll remind you, like, what does factoring mean? Um, you want to write this numerator and the denominator as a product of two factors, um, x plus or minus something, x plus or minus something. I'll let, I'll let you fill it. I'll give you a chance to fill it in before I do it. And you want to find numbers here that are going to multiply to 3 and add up to negative 4. You want to find numbers here that will multiply to negative 12 and then add up to 1. So I'll give you a half a minute to do that.
So after giving you a chance to work on it first, uh, for the numerator, for this top part, I'm seeing that, well, if I want numbers that multiply to three, my choices are one and three or negative one and negative three. Since I want them to also add up to negative four, definitely I'm gonna pick negative three and negative one. When you expand that out using FOIL method or distributive property, whatever you want, you'll see the answer is x squared minus four x plus three. Similarly, what are the factors of 12? Um, one and like 12 or two and six or three and four are, are basically your options, at least if you're expecting a factorization with integer coefficients. Of course, every quadratic, you can find the roots with the quadratic formula. Um, uh, but this technique is especially good when you're expecting all the coefficients to be integers, but, as is the case in these early uh, sort of contrived examples. So here I'm thinking um, probably four and negative three. Will, will give me just what I want because four, you know, four X minus three X gives me X and then negative three times four gives me negative 12. Even if you didn't recognize that you could, you could find one of the factors immediately because you know that when you plugged in three, you got zero so that three had to be a root of both of these polynomials. So that um, you knew that X minus three was gonna be one of the factors because three was a root. So you could have, like if you didn't recognize this or don't like factoring, you could have also chosen to do polynomial division if you remember that. And that would have also given you the x minus one term. Okay, and so this tells us that when x is not equal to three, I can cancel these out. It also tells us why we get zero over zero when we plug in x equals three. And since when I'm taking the limit, I don't need to consider values equal to three, I just need to consider values near to three. Uh, it's therefore valid to cancel these two out when I'm taking the limit. So if, if I didn't have the limit here, it wouldn't actually be valid to just cancel these out because uh, basically you're changing the domain of, of the function. You're allowing it to be defined at x equals three, whereas this expression is not allowed to be defined at x equals three. But once again, to emphasize when you're calculating a limit, you're just considering values that are close to three. In that case, you're able to make this cancellation you end up with x minus one over x plus four. And now this function is continuous at x equals three. Uh, but we know that because in fact, every polynomial is continuous. And so a ratio of two polynomials is always going to be continuous so long as the denominator is not equal to zero. That's why this expression was not continuous at x equals three while this expression is continuous at x equals three. And we can calculate the limit just by plugging in. That's gonna be three minus one over three plus four. So the answer here is two sevenths. So the limit of this expression as x goes to three is two sevenths, even though it was an indeterminate form. Let me pause for questions. You can ask them or put them in the chat. Okay. So I think the bread and butter, if you like, of this section is really how do you calculate limits when they're given by an indeterminate form. And once again, you're not always going to be able to do it. Uh, you can, in many instances, you'll have to like plug it into a computer or do like an estimation. 
but but there are certain search situations where you can uh, certainly like ratio of two polynomials when you can where you can factor it. And there's other instances too, and I want to detail through some of them. And you'll be seeing these on on homework exercises as well. So let's go through some more examples. So let's take this is a book example. Let, let's take limit. x goes to 9 of x minus 9 over square root of x minus 3. And whenever you're asked to calculate a limit, go ahead and try just plugging it in and seeing whether or not you're dealing with an indeterminate form. So if I look at nine minus nine, which is zero, and then square root of nine minus three, that gives me three minus three. I say that this is indeterminate um, with the form zero over zero. So how can we do that? Like once again, we need to re-express this We need to re-express this in, in such a way that, that uh, we don't get 0 over 0. And how can you do that? Uh, you can try factoring the numerator again. Uh, there is a technique here, though, that works pretty well that I'll show you. It's uh, what you call uh, rationalizing. Rationalizing the denominator. Uh, what that means is like you've got a square root here, which uh, is often going to be like an irrational number. And you can do a process to basically eliminate that square root and get a, a rational expression for the denominator. And the way you can do that, there's an old saying that like mathematicians like to add zero and multiply by one. And in this case, we're gonna multiply by the number one. So we're not gonna change the value of this. We're gonna multiply top and bottom by root x plus three divided by root x plus three. So notice that I take this root x plus three over root x plus three, that's definitely equal to one. Multiplication by one does not change the value of the expression. So I wanna to emphasize to you that I've not changed the value of the expression. Just doing an algebraic technique to simplify it. So on the numerator, I'm gonna leave this as minus x as x minus nine root x plus three. But on the denominator, I'm going to multiply it through. You might remember from algebra, this is a special product. Uh, a minus b times a plus b, that's a squared minus b squared. Here, a is root x, b is equal to three. So the answer is x minus nine. And so check that out. You can now, oh, and I made a little mistake because I should have still written down limit, limit as x goes to nine. And now since I'm taking a limit and I've, and I've got this expression, the numerator and the denominator, I can cancel them and I can see that this limit is gonna be equal to the limit as x goes to nine of square root x plus And now there's no issue. I can just plug in nine and I no longer get an indeterminate form and I'm gonna get three plus three equals six. So that's the answer to this original problem. The limit as X goes to nine of X minus nine over root X plus three is equal to six. And I mean, it's possible to figure this out another way, like the way we did previously. So 
just want to emphasize this to you. If you're given this problem, if you're able to recognize that x minus 9 is equal to, if you're able to factor this as root x minus 3, root x plus 3, then by all means, go for it. And then you can make this cancellation. And get the same result. But it's not always so easy to see these factorizations like that involves square roots. And because of that, this idea of rationalizing the denominator whenever you've got a square root there will also lead you to, uh, will also often lead you to a good place. So any questions? So what about some equations that um, that don't have the same factors like x minus 3? Yeah, that's a good question. Let me write down an example. This one I'll just make up. So let's do limit x goes to 2 of x minus 1, x plus 3 over x minus 2. So if you have a, a rational function like this one, and you factored it, and you found that there's not a matching factor in numerator and denominator, then you don't have an indeterminate form. So for instance, when you plug in x equals 2, you're going to get 2 minus 1 is 1. You're going to get 2 plus 3 is 5. And you're going to get 2 minus 2. You're going to get 5 over 0. So just like I mentioned in, in my video, it's still not accurate to say this is the answer because this is not a continuous function at x equals 2. But it's also true that this is not an indeterminate form because from this form, I can determine a couple things about this limit. I can determine that the limit doesn't exist, first of all. And I can determine that um, depending on whether x is bigger than or less than 2, the limit is either tending towards infinity or towards negative infinity. So I think that like when x is bigger than 2, it'll be going to infinity. Let me draw, let me try to sketch the graph of x minus 1, x plus 3. So it has this vertical asymptote when x is equal to 2. It's not defined there. When x is bigger than 2, it's going off to infinity. When x is less than 2, it's going off to negative infinity. And then it does other things you know, as x gets away from the point 2. But when we're calculating a limit, we're just looking at um, values that are close to the number in question. So you might be able to hear my cat. My cat's over there in the background chirping a little bit, um, looking for some attention. But the cat's going to have to wait a few more minutes. Um, so what I do learn is that limit as x goes to 2 from the right, so like from this way, of this function, let's call it f of x, is equal to plus infinity, while the limit as x goes to 2 from the left is equal to, to negative infinity. But you would not call that an indeterminate form, because it's not in a form where you can't determine the limit. You can. You can determine that it doesn't exist, and that the one side limits properly diverge to plus infinity or negative infinity. So I'll move on to some more examples. And you're always welcome to yell out a question or put, put more stuff in the chat.
let's look at some trigonometric limits. So again, this one's from the book. Let's look at limit as x goes to pi over two. of tangent x over secant of x. And so you're, you know, as we're going through this, you're discovering that like in order to do these problems, you know, now you're seeing why we need some algebra. And so here, in order to do this problem, we need to be able to evaluate both tangent of x and secant of x at the point pi over two. So we need to know some things about this, about this function. I believe we discussed earlier in class that um, like maybe last time, that tangent of x is definitely not defined at pi over two. Uh, so I'll put it in quotes. <laughs> tangent of pi over two is, is quote unquote equal to infinity. What I mean there is, is you've got this, you know, we saw the graph last time, but you've got this nice um, vertical asymptote and tangent of zero is zero and we're coming up like that and then back down like that. So the limit of tangent as x goes to pi over two from the left is infinity as x goes to pi over two from the right is actually negative infinity. Um, and what about secant? Uh, secant of x, just remind you that's one over cosine of x. And you might remember that cosine of pi over two, try to get better camera focus there. You might remember that cosine of pi over two is equal to zero. So one over cosine pi over two, that's definitely going to be uh, trending towards infinity. So this looks like an indeterminate form infinity over infinity. So we're not gonna be able to make an, a conclusion about the limit just by plugging in pi over two. Uh, therefore, we need to see if like there's some algebraic cancellation perhaps that's going on. And if algebra doesn't work, my next step would be using a graphing calculator. But one thing I like to do when I see an indeterminate form I like to substitute in, like what are the definitions for what, for what this stuff means? So tangent of x is gonna be sine of x over cosine of x. Secant of x is gonna be one over cosine of x. So you get this big improper fraction. And so to succeed in this class, we're gonna to wanna to have some comfort in how to, in, we're gonna to wanna to be comfortable in, in how to transfer a fraction from being improper like this to, to just, just having the form A over B. And in this case, what you can do is multiply, again, you do this trick of multiplying by one, but in this case, you're gonna do multiplying by cosine X divided by cosine X. So multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the same function is not going to change the value of the expression. And when I do this, I'll get limit as x goes to pi over two. And here on the denominator, I just get one. And here on the numerator, I get a cancellation with the, with the cosine. So I'm just left with sine of x. So in fact, tangent x over secant x is just another way of rewriting sine of x. And so you can therefore calculate the limit just by plugging in sine of pi over two, which is equal to one. And let's actually take a second and let's try to explore this on the, on the graphing software. So let me pull up Desmos. Let 
let me look at tangent of x and secant of x. So let me share this with you so you can see. See if I can remember how to restrict the range. Let's just go from zero to prime. go from zero to pi in order to make the graph a little bit less busy. So the red line is tangent of x and the blue line is secant of x. And I'm graphing it on the interval from zero to pi. And I'll draw a line through pi over two. So you can see that asymptote and so when you're looking at the ratio of tangent x to secant of x, what's happening is these individual functions, yeah, the individual numerator and denominator are both running off to infinity or negative infinity, but they're getting so close together that their ratio is getting really close to one. So in fact, let's look at y equals tangent x divided by secant of x. And you can see that it's not going to be defined exactly at pi over 2. Uh, you got that approximation there. Uh, it's not exactly going to be defined at pi over 2, but, but the limit, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have pi over 2 built into the system. Otherwise, it would show you undefined. Um, but the limit as x goes to pi over 2 is definitely equal to 1 that you can see you can see here. So again, new numerator and denominator individually compare their ratio. It goes to 1, even though numerator and denominator are going to infinity. So that's how you can have an indeterminate form that still has a limit. So are there any questions about what I'm displaying to you? So we'll go back to document camera now. Class has a little bit of a different feel when I'm when I'm working from the home office. <laughs> a little bit different tech setup. Uh, let's give you an example of the form uh, infinity minus infinity. Let's take limit as x goes to 1. And all these you're seeing are, are basically reducing to algebra problems. So, so let's take 1 over x minus 1 minus 2 over x squared minus 1. And if you just plug in x equals 1, what happens is you get 1 over 0 minus 2 over 0. So this is an indeterminate form um, that looks like infinity minus infinity. And you might be tempted to say that infinity minus infinity is always going to be 0. But like if one thing is going to infinity much faster than the other one, um, it could be the case that an indeterminate form of infinity minus infinity that like could be equal to like 2 or 3. Uh, or it, it might not even exist. It could be equal to infinity. Um, we don't know just by plugging it in, just by looking at that form. So we should try to do some algebra. And here my advice to you is to uh, search for a common denominator. And so me, when I'm searching for a common denominator, I'm, I'm realizing that um, x squared minus 1 times x squared plus 1 gives me x squared minus 1. So I'm going to first try this trick of saying, like, multiplying x plus 1, multiplying x plus 1. I'll write out some steps so you see what I'm doing. So 
So I didn't change the value of the expression. That's important. But for the for the first one, I multiplied on top and bottom by x plus 1. The reason why I did that is I can now multiply this out and get x squared plus 1 on the denominator. It's going to give me x plus 1. And I'll bring this over the single denominator, x plus 1 minus 2 divided through by x. Um, I'll keep it factored, x minus 1, so x plus 1. So you see that I'm just, just subtracting the two fractions from each other and noting that their denominator is the same because x squared minus 1 is equal to x minus 1 times x plus 1. And so x minus x plus 1 minus 2, I can easily calculate. And that's going to come out to be x minus 1. Everything divided by now x minus 1 times x plus 1. So you can see why I kept that denominator in factored form now. So now I can just cancel out this factor of x minus 1, leaving me with a limit of, as x goes to 1 of 1 over x plus 1, which is now equal to 1 half. So the indeterminate form was infinity over infinity, but the difference between the two expressions was tending towards 1 half as x tended towards 1. I'm also illustrating for you, um, like your handwriting is probably going to be better than mine. My handwriting is not great, but I'm illustrating for you uh, the process of, of how to show your steps. So uh, what I hope is that these one, two, three, four, five, six steps, um, each one is evident, right? So I hope it's reasonably evident that I just multiply top and bottom by x plus one, that I then put over the common denominator, that I then worked this out and canceled, and here's my conclusion. And so you can write the same way when you're on a test. So, so this is what we mean when we say, like, are we showing the steps that we're taking to obtain our answer? Pause for questions while I'm looking up a new example. Let's do an example that's a, a little bit more geared towards some of the concepts we introduced earlier in the course, uh, namely this idea of the slope of a secant line. So if you go back to y equals x squared and we draw its graph schematically, And I want to look at x equals 1. And I want to go out some small distance to a new point, say x equals 1 plus h. So think of h as being like a small number. I've drawn it a little bigger in the picture just so that you can actually see it. And if I walk up to the graph, so here's the point x f of x, so x, x squared. And here's the point x um, x plus h squared. Although in my example, x was equal to 1. So I should really say 1, 1. And here I should say, since x is equal to 1, that's 1, 1 plus h squared. And if I want to figure out the slope of the secant line between those two points, that slope is the 
change in y over the change in x, which in this case, the change in y is, is what? It's like 1 plus h squared. That's this one, minus 1 divided by the change in x. And <laughs> my x value here is, is 1. My x value there is 1. Looks like the change in x is 0. That's because I, I made a mistake. So x was 1 plus h. So I, I really should have written x plus h. And therefore, this one would be 1 plus h. Apologize for that typographical mistake. But it, it's, it's clear here on my figure that x is 1 and x is 1 plus h. And so therefore, the difference between the x values would be 1 plus h minus 1. So it's just going to be h on the denominator. Why am I setting it up like that? So suppose I want to know the instantaneous rate of change at x equals 1. I think we figured this out for x equals 2 the other day. Suppose I want to figure out the instantaneous rate of change at x equals 1. That is to say, what are the slopes of the secant lines approaching as the second point tends towards 1? Or in other words, as h tends towards 0. Instantaneous rate of change is the limit of the average rates of change. The average rate of change from 1 to 1 plus h is this change in y over change in x. It's the slope of the secret line. So the instantaneous rate of change is now the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 plus h squared minus 1 divided by h. This is why we care about limits in calculus, because in, in calculus, we're concerned with calculating instantaneous rates of change. And we're not going to be able to do that just by plugging in h equals 0, because we would just get indeterminate form 0 over 0. So whenever you're calculating an instantaneous rate of change, that limit is always going to be an indeterminate form. And last time we confronted this, we just made a table of values. We used the graphing software to estimate what the instantaneous rate of change would be. The cool thing here is we no longer have to estimate. We can calculate this out exactly using algebra. So let's see how that's done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this out. And I have to multiply out um, 1 plus h squared. And the answer is, is 1 squared plus 2 times 1 times h plus h squared. And then minus 1, everything divided by h. And so look what happens. This I get 1 minus 1, which is 0. And what I'm left with is simply 2h plus h squared divided by h. And of course, I can factor out h to give me h times 2 plus h. So I can factor out an h and cancel with the, the denominator to give me 2 plus h as my answer. In other words, the slope of the secant line is given by this expression. But if you just reduce this expression using algebra, you end up learning that this expression is also equal to 2 plus h, so long as h is not equal to 0. Should have moved the paper up to make it easier to see. Apologize for that. So now that you've got this rewriting of the expression, it's much easier to see that as h goes to 0, the limit's going to be equal to 2. So the instantaneous velocity is 
equal to two. Pause for any questions or comments. So let me just pick a, a chapter exercise at random and do it. I don't know if this is a homework problem or not. I'm just sort of going randomly. If I accidentally do one of your homework exercises, then, then you lucked out. If not, then this will give you some more practice to see. Um, Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, anything is kind of fine. Uh, maybe I'll choose number 16. Maybe in later classes, I can just let you all sort of pick for me and, and we can just do one. Uh, so this is uh, 2.5 question 16. And it says calculate the limit as h goes to 4 h plus 2 squared minus 9h over h minus 4. And so definitely this is an indeterminate form. If you just plug in h equals, well, actually, is it? Let's check. Sorry, let, let's check. So if you just plug in h equals 4, the denominator is definitely going to be 0. What's going to be the numerator? So I'm going to get 4 plus 2 is 6, which is 36, minus 9 times 4, which is 36. So 0 over 0. It's, it's worth checking that you actually have an indeterminate form in the beginning, because if you don't, then you'll be able to, to calculate that limit probably just by plugging in or or if it's, you'll be able to see it's going to infinity. You can save yourself some time that way. But we know this is indeterminate, so we expect that this numerator has a factor of four in it. And so let's figure that out. So this is basically an algebra problem. So expanding this out, I'm gonna get h squared plus four h plus four. Correct me if I make a mistake, because that happens sometimes. And minus nine h over h minus 4. I'll put, put this in a box. It's not part of my chain of equalities. And what next? Let's collect terms. 4h minus 9h, that's minus 5h. So this is, I recognize how this is going to factor. So remember at the top of class, we want multiply to 4, add up to negative 5. There's only two numbers that do that. That's negative 1 and negative 4. So h minus 4, h minus 1, is going to give me the factorization there. Cancel out those factors of h minus 4. I'm getting now the limit, h goes to 4. So even though I can see the answer, I'm still taking care to write out all of my steps and show to the reader a good conclusion. Uh, so limit as h goes to 4 of h minus 1 is now equal to, by the limit laws, it's equal to 4 minus 1, which is equal to, to 3. So that's, can I put it all on one screen? So yeah, that's how I do that problem. And you don't necessarily need to include this um, when you're turning in homework. We might put that on scratch paper. Okay, any final questions or comments about, about anything along those lines? Did I see you raise your hand, uh, Cecile? Okay. Um, so that being the case, uh, you've already got some homework up that includes this section and I'll see you on Monday and we'll, we'll just go straight to section 2.6, um, the squeeze theorem and trigonometric limits I, I do have videos on that as well. So I'll ask you to watch 
I'll, I'll post a link to it, but you can also find it through that big playlist. Um, so I'll ask you to watch that video in advance of class. So they're, they're all between five and 12 minutes. Um, just to introduce the topic, and we'll be talking about section 2.6 squeeze theorem on, on Monday. Uh, be welcome to pre-read, make class go a little bit easier for you. As always, be welcome to email me any comments or questions, and it's great to see you. Have a great weekend.